Welcome to day 51 of our Luke Acts Bible Project devotional. And we find ourselves today in Acts chapter 27. And this is one of those very eventful chapters because a lot of stuff is happening to Paul. And yet it's a long chapter. And yet it's kind of speaking about this ride in a ship that Paul takes. And it seems like a very odd um, way in which Dr. Luke gives a ton of facts. He gives numbers. He's very specific about where they've been, where they're going to. He's this detailed historian. And yet it's just kind of amazing how detailed it is and how much time and effort he puts into this ship ride. It just seems rather odd. But there's this belief as to why he does that kind of biblically. So Peter, could you share a little bit about this boat ride that we find the Apostle Paul in? And what is Paul, Luke trying to tell us and what's God trying to tell us through this? Well, for one, um, this is one of the wee passages of Acts. This is one of these moments where the author, Luke, sounds like he is presently there with Paul. and um, That's verse 20, by the way. And uh, there was a period of time where biblical scholars thought, um, and again, we've talked about this a little bit, but um, critical biblical scholarship is all about um, not taking things for granted and seeing what you can corroborate. And so they thought, well, what are the chances that Luke isn't actually with Paul? What might that be? Um, and there was a tradition um, in the ancient world of sometimes having historians narrate um, sea journeys with the first person plural, with the we, even mm -hmm. though they weren't actually there. Right. Um, that theory has since sort of been debunked because there are all these moments where, where Luke uses we and it's not a naval voyage. Right. So it makes more sense to assume the obvious answer, which is just that he's there with them. That's also probably some of the reason for the immense amount of detail here about where they are. And it's the centurion from the Augustan cohort named Julius. Um, I don't think we have that guy's name written anywhere, but that's a very imaginable thing that someone from mm -hmm. the cohort would have that name. And where the ship was originally from, um, to say embarking in a ship of Adramidium doesn't mean um, that that's where they got on, that's where the ship was from. So that's where they had built the ship and here's all the places to go. And, and so Luke is just kind of recollecting. And if we think about the theory, which is I think as good a theory as any, that Paul writes this, while the, start, starts writing the book of Acts while they're at Caesarea and doesn't finish the book of Acts but, and finishes the book of Acts before Paul's trial in you Rome. You mean Luke was writing. And yeah, uh, so, so Luke writes it while, Paul, while he's with Paul in Caesarea. Right. And then writes up, up, just up until Paul's trial. Yes. Then you'd imagine that this stuff is like hot off the press, right? Correct. Like this would be in a period in which Luke has written the majority of the narrative and then is writing more real time. So perhaps mm -hmm. he writes this part while they're in Rome and Paul is awaiting trial. Right. And the detail is specific. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite incredible. And one of the phrases that always jumps off the page at me in Acts chapter 27 is this one. It's verse 20. It says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And notice the we in there. Luke is saying that the entire ship is so battered and worn out, they're just utterly convinced that because of the, the state of the ocean or the sea that they're in, the storm is raging, that all of them are going to die. And, you know, I've thought about at times where there's this sense of you've got the Apostle Paul, you've got Luke, and Luke is saying all of us gave up all hope. We just thought it was completely over. And I, I think sometimes, maybe even during the COVID-19 crisis, there are people who find a, a depth of hopelessness in their own hearts and their own lives. But here we see that this struck even the giants of faith, people like Luke. And Peter, we have to think about everything Luke's observed up until this point. Um, I would think that the Apostle Paul had told Luke, Luke, Jesus told me, we're going to go to Rome. I don't think he would have hidden that from Luke. And so... Yet in the midst of it, Luke is making kind of the self-confession that he has absolutely lost all hope and he's assuming that he's going to die. So Peter, what else kind of perks your interest? Well, after that moment, that's when Paul gets the ship together and says precisely that. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, an angel is sent to me and said, we're not going to die. Right. And, and you know, if, if Luke is on this boat, um, if we take the we at face value, 
um, then one major theme of these last two chapters in Acts makes some more sort of personal sense. One of the things we're seeing is that Luke is sort of um, drawing out the difficulty it takes to get Paul to Rome. Like there's going to be a shipwreck. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a snake bite. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and what Luke seems to be doing is trying to really kind of like beat into the reader's vision, like just so you like don't miss this. It took God so much to get Paul to Rome. We went through a two-week uh, storm. Where we they all thought they were going to die. Yep. We, Paul survived yep. a snake bite. I mean, just like the stuff that happens. And if you imagine that not only as Luke reporting facts, but Luke recounting this personal journey he was on, where his life, he had mm -hmm. given up all hope. Mm -hmm. And then because of what God wanted to do through Paul, and assumedly also through Luke, God delivers them into safety. And so just the, um, the way in which that on a narrative level, this is trying to talk about the power of God to bring about the purpose of God. It's also a deeply personal story for Luke because it's the power of God in the purpose of God in his own life. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I like about this text, Peter, is that when there's a movement for people to abandon ship, which probably would have ended their lives. The Apostle Paul intervenes and actually makes sure that the entire crew gets saved, right? And so we discover that in the midst of all of this suffering and everything that's going on with the Apostle Paul, he's still concerned about those that are around, them, around him and he's reaching out to them. And then another verse that I really like, it's sort of the last paragraph here where it basically says that the soldiers have made the determination that the shipwreck has happened, they've struck ground, it's broken to pieces, and they're just going to start killing all the prisoners. But what's fascinating is the leader here likes Paul so much that he intervenes and says, don't kill any of the prisoners, like let them all live. And it's, I think not only is Luke, Peter, giving us a window into his own soul, I think here we're kind of getting a window into the Apostle Paul's world as well. The captain of the ship really likes Paul. There's this affinity that he has for Paul. There's a lot of this relationality that's happening. So it's not all this brute force, you know, Paul the missionary kind of grinding it out, although he does, but there's this sense there of the relationality of Paul as well, which I love the fact we're a relationally driven church. You can't help but to see that in there as well. So Peter, is there anything else that comes to mind? Well, on a less personal level, one of the things we have going on here is Luke um, feeding this story and reading this story through the story of Jonah. And um, it's maybe not, uh, it's probably not worth pushing that too terribly far, but um, one of the things we see going on um, in that Jonah connection is a, um, a deep emphasis on the fact that this is a mission to the Gentiles. Just like Jonah tried not to go to the Gentiles, didn't want to go to Nineveh, tries to flee to Tarshish, shipwrecked, swallowed, carried back to Nineveh. Well, here we have Paul also living through a shipwreck, also saving the crew, uh, also living through a storm and also saving the crew. And he also, like Jonah, is on his way to share the message that God has for him to bring to the Gentiles. So there's also that background kind of feeding in there. Right. Well, as we look at the end of this chapter, the last verse says, the rest were able to get on planks and the other pieces of the ship and everyone reached land safely. And although that verse seems kind of trivial, you know what it speaks to for me, Peter, is that Paul's following of Jesus and the call of God on his life and what Paul is doing, a lot of this had incredible stress and strain. It took tons of effort. Paul makes the promise that if everyone stays on the ship, they're all going to survive. Well, none of them would have anticipated that that involved the shipwreck that they were afraid of. I'm sure they thought when they pull into this safe harbor, which they do, they think, oh, we're going to make it. This guy had heard from God. We're going to be able to glide into that harbor and it's going to be easy and safe. And the next thing they find is the thing that they've been fearing all along happens anyway, yet every single one of them survive. And so one of the things this always speaks to me about is there is a sense at times, which is erroneous, that if we're following God, 
and we're actually doing what God has called us to do, that it's going to be easy, it's going to be simple, the road to it is straight, it's going to be predictable. And what we're finding here in this first century church is that almost none of that is true. Following Jesus does involve suffering. It involves giving up a lot of things. It involves listening to the voice of, voice of God and no doubt uh, anticipating what that might look like. But I, there's no possible way Paul could have prescribed this, this journey that was in front of him. And I, I want to keep saying this because I think it's important to hear. And that is there is a version of Christianity that's out there today that basically says, if you follow Jesus and you have enough faith, you will be living the American dream. Everything's going to be awesome. You'll become healthy and wealthy and everyone's going to love you. And what's, what needs to be clearly said is that the epicenter of the Newer Testament teaches us that that simply isn't true. And it doesn't mean that God's not going to bless some of us. It doesn't mean that. But what it is telling us clearly here is the people that are taking the gospel seriously are oftentimes called to suffer and to follow Jesus in a path that no one would sign up for on their own. Yeah. I think uh, also um, a version of the Christian gospel, which I think we would want to say is inaccurate, sometimes to the point of dangerous, um, that sometimes goes by the title, The Prosperity Gospel, mm -hmm. oftentimes includes the claim that suffering in your life is a sign that you, in fact, have done something wrong. Correct. That you don't have enough faith is, I think, often the charge. And what we're seeing here is, is something very, very different, which is that true faith doesn't mean that you won't have anything wrong in your life. But true faith does seem to mean that as you follow the way of Jesus, that the good and the bad are conformed to him. And so later, Paul's going to talk about knowing Jesus in his suffering mm -hmm. as much as he knows him in all the other positive stuff in his life. And so as the Bible Project video that we saw a couple of days ago points out, it's probably one of the reasons why Luke is trying to highlight all the ways that Paul's death in a different city under different circumstances is a whole lot like Jesus's death in Jerusalem on Holy Week to, on a literary level, make clear the theological truth that what Paul is living through is actually a death in the Messiah in the mm -hmm. same way that his life has been a life in the Messiah. And so um, I think that is the more uh, chastened and chastening promise of the Christian gospel. We look at the world and we go, suffering comes to everybody. And there is nothing in the world that can actually keep your life perfectly pleasant. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of relational capital. Um, there is uh, no amount of um, uh, uh, medical technology or human Or having enough faith of the right kind. Have, that's yep. going to keep suffering yep. out of your life. Right. In fact, what Jesus promises is that at the end of time, all things will be made well. And in the meantime, that you'll travel with the God who made the world and who has given himself for the love of us. And that, I think, is why the Holy Spirit is such an important resource at a time when we're recognizing that a lot of the things we thought could carry us through to a life of mm -hmm. total pleasantness actually can't do that. Mm -hmm. And that there might be no way to have a totally undisturbed life. And so we believe that God journeys with people through and in suffering towards an ultimate vision of things being made right. So Peter, with that as our final thought, would you send us out in prayer? Sure, let's pray. Um, Jesus, there's this vision in the New Testament of you at the end of time as a lamb who has already been slain but is alive again, ruling in the center of a new Jerusalem. This realization that your power doesn't preclude failure. Even failure can't stop you from being a success, so to speak. And that's the God that we pray to and yes. who has invited us into a life of relationship with him. And so God, who knows both death and resurrection life, we ask you to carry us by your spirit, yes. the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead at this time, so that as we face death and disappointment, hardship, failure, and suffering, that even so, your life and joy and peace can coexist with that and can overcome that in the midst of that. We trust you, Jesus, with our lives today, with our lives entirely, and we ask you to journey with us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for viewing this video with us, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.